Hi everybody. Today I want to talk to you about resurrecting the church. The resurrection of Jesus is the most significant day in the history of the world and the history of my life. The book of Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So our salvation is directly uh, connected not only to the resurrection of Jesus, but uh, what we think and what we believe about the resurrection of Jesus. Now, I don't want to make light of this wonderful day, so I want to celebrate with you by reading this passage of Scripture about the resurrection. Matthew 28, 1 through 6. Now, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other uh, Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen, as he said. So happy Resurrection Day. May the life and the resurrection power of Jesus touch your life and change your life from glory to glory in Jesus' name. Now, I wanted to talk to you today about something that God put in my heart called the resurrection of the church. You say, well, the church is already resurrected. You know, many of us as individuals and many of us, many churches, fall asleep and, and even in a sense die. They lose that flame. They lose that passion for God. And when they do, they find themselves, uh, you know, just wrestling with life and wrestling with purpose. So I believe that God is wanting to use this special time in history, this divine shutdown, this divine reset. God is wanting to use this to reset, to revive, and to resurrect the church of Jesus Christ. All of us, I think, are asking certain questions, and I wrote seven of them down. One, why did God allow this virus? Now, some people say God sent it or God made it happen. I don't know. I don't want to argue about it. All we know is it's here, and the Bible says in Romans 8, 28, it says, and we know that all things are working together to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. The virus is not good. The coronavirus is not good, but all things are working together for our good. So we need to see the good. Why did God allow this to happen? Number two, why did this happen in the year of perfect vision? Now, 2020, there's only one year called 2020 in the history of the world. And God has a sense of the dramatic. And this, this uh, number, 2020, God knew it's the number, not just a vision, but it's the number or the numbers of perfect vision. In fact, we could call this the year of perfect vision. And at some point early in the year of perfect vision, God shuts down the entire world. Every church is empty just about. And everyone is sitting at home contemplating, God, what is your true vision for my life and for the church? Now, I believe God wants to reset that vision. I believe God wants to speak to you and talk to you. You know that it's become real popular right now, that scripture that says, and from Chronicles, it says, if my people who are called by my name would repent and turn away from their wickedness, I will hear from heaven and heal their land. I'm paraphrasing. And it's true that I believe that real change, real resetting comes from a repentance. But what repentance? You know, you don't want to just repent for just anything. You want to really be sincere and say, you know, God, I want to stop and say I've been wrong. Now, God doesn't always encourage us. Some people think church is all about encouragement. They think it's all about worship. Those are good things, but it's like eating candy all the time or cake all the time. It's great to have it, but the Bible says the Word of God is for rebuke and reproof and for correction so that you can become who you're supposed to be. So even though this might not sound super happy, I believe this is a time of correction, a, a um, 
season of correction where God wants to show us something. And don't misunderstand. Repentance is not God saying, you're terrible and I hate you. It's, a, it's like a father saying, you're doing that wrong. I want you to change that. And I want this to be a season of real repentance and change and hearing from God for your life. The third question is, why did God allow the shutting down of all the churches? Of all things, how is it good that the churches have all shut down, the services? Well, because church was never a service, and God is illustrating that to us. Church was always the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Jesus, and the people. Now, I've been around for a long time, seen a lot, seen a lot of movements come and go. But what I can discern from what I see right now is that well-meaning people, uh, at one point when the church was in a slump, started asking another question, which is, what do people want from the church? And what is it that they don't like about church? Some people call it the seeker-sensitive movement. And these are really awesome, well-meaning people. And they begin to build churches around this concept of what, is the, what are the people looking for? They said stuff like, well, people are asking questions that we aren't answering, and we're answering questions that they aren't asking. And that was true. And it was, in a sense, revolutionary because these big churches began to emerge, but they were lowest common denominator because the, these were churches that really felt that people don't like to be challenged. They don't like to be called to repentance. They don't like to, you know, be confronted. And so as great as that movement, and, and I was part of it in a sense, because a lot of times we want to shake off the past and say, what's not necessary? Let's not do it anymore. But in, but, but in a, a more real sense, people don't need to be telling God what they want from church. Pastors and the church needs to be telling the people what God wants from them. We don't change, the, we don't change God to fit the people. We change the people to fit God's word so that they can truly have a blessed life, so they can truly have their best life. God is an encourager. He is a blesser, but he is also a corrector. And if you miss that, then you're going to miss all the great things that God has for you. If, if you didn't listen to your coach or your teacher in school, you're going to blow it because they weren't there just to encourage you all the time. They corrected you because they know that you cannot become who you're supposed to be without correction. And this is the season of divine correction, not sad, but God directing us and resetting us. And why is it? Number four, why is God temporarily emptying out all of our beautiful buildings? Well, because the church has never been a building. And God is telling us the church is not a building. You can have a building, but it's a poor excuse for you being a Christian, going to a building once a week and saying, well, I'm a Christian. That doesn't make you a Christian. Anyway, someone said like going into a garage doesn't make you a car. Going into a church, going to church doesn't make you a Christian. It's time that we stop trusting our services as our source and our buildings as the church because this is something you can repent of. I repent of calling that building the church because it's not the church. It's a building the church meets in. And I don't mean to split hairs, but I do believe it's very important that you remind yourself we are the church. And God is not looking from some, for something from that building. He's looking for something from your life. Now, God could be saying, instead of saying, come to the church, maybe God is saying, go to the world. Maybe what Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 28 when he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Maybe God is renewing that commission on his church saying, hey, stop trying to get people to come to church. Start trying to get the church to go to the people. I don't believe that people have a problem with Jesus. I think they have a problem going to church. But if we full of the Holy Spirit, go to the people, then they're going to get to see that this is real. It's not some organization. It's not some, you know, set of rules. It's a relationship. It's power in your life. And God is resetting it. Number five, why is this timed perfectly to cancel Easter service? I mean, what's more popular and what means more to Christians than Easter Sunday morning? And here is God cancel the whole thing. And you're sitting at home watching me on a video. I mean, I thought it was God's favorite day. I thought it was the one day that everybody's going to dress up and make a big deal out of God. And God, in essence, said, no thanks. God, in essence, said, you know, I don't want that. 
isn't it weird that it, the coronavirus is going to be over just past Easter? It was almost God, like God made a point, like, you know what? I don't need that. No, thank you. Because Easter, to me, typifies the problem. Some people think you can just go to church every Sunday and, and you, you're an on-fire Christian. Others think and that this is the whole world. They think, dress your kids up once a year and come to God's house and do him a favor and show your deep devotion that one day. God is not asking for one day of your life. God is asking for your whole life. Listen, if you don't give God your whole life, you don't get all of God's. If you give half of yourself, you don't get half of God. You get none of God. Christianity from the time of the cross was about laying everything down and calling out to God and saying, use my life for your glory. Nothing less. And I'm kind of smiling when I think how God just said, you know what, all that music and dressing up and all that you do with the flowers and the bunny and all that, God is saying, no, thank you. I want to talk to you for a second. And that's where we're sitting here right now in the middle of the great divine correction, the great divine reset. Ultimately, there's nothing that says reducing the church to the smallest common denominator is Easter Sunday morning when one Sunday caps it off for the whole year. You say, well, I did my thing for God. Well, listen, you're lying to yourself. You're just telling yourself that's not true. God is asking for your whole life, not one day a year. You cannot reduce God to fit your life. You don't get any of God that way. And I don't mean to sound angry or mean because I'm not. I want to help you. I want you to enter into the life of God. Number six, this is an important one. What is God saying? What is God saying? Well, right now, God is saying, this is my moment to reset your life and reset the church. And number seven, why? Why? Well, why is God doing it? Because we left the simplicity and the passion and the purpose and drifted into convenience and spiritual summarizing, like give, let's boil it down to just give God blah, blah, and, and insulting the sacrifice and the passion of the cross by reducing church to a minimal commitment, a bother in your life and still you're devoted. Now, I don't want to be sar sarcastic, but God did all this because he wants to do a divine reset in your life. Maybe a lot of people are not going to listen or pay attention, but that has nothing to do with you. This, your relationship with God is about you and God, not about you and the ch church people or people that you know, comparing yourself to them. This is about what Jesus wants to do through your life, why you were born. Let me read you this scripture that the Lord put on my heart for this particular Resurrection Sunday. Matthew 21, 12 through 17. Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and turned, overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. Now, I want you to see this. You say, Pastor Brett, how does that fit into what you're saying? Well, listen, just actually when Passover began, which is just happened this week, Jesus cleansed the temple. Now, he had cleansed it once before. He had did, he'd done this twice. He had braided a special whip just to whip the people that were going into the church and making a mockery out of sacrifice. Now, you say, well, what, what, why did he do that? Well, listen. Well, this was Passover, so God had three great feasts a year, and the Israelis would come from all over. And when they came, they were to bring their first and their best, their sacrifice. And so over time, when the priests realized there's some money to be made here, they said, well, you know what? Don't worry about bringing your best. Don't worry about bringing your offering. Just bring some money from your country with you. And we'll make a little money on the exchange, like when they went from, you know, dollars to pesos. 
the temple had its own currency, so everybody had to change money. So they'd make a little money on the exchange, and then they would sell you a bull. Now, if you were rich enough to have a bull, you should have brought your best cross country with you. But instead, you could buy a bull and make it convenient. And you had no personal affection to that bull. Or many people, you know, what God required was your best lamb that you raised and you cared for and you watched over and it was, the, it was close to your heart and you would bring an offer to God and it hurts. It was valuable. It was a sacrifice. And here they said, well, just bring the money and you know, uh, you, you know, you can just buy your sheep here. And you didn't care a whit about that sheep. And your offering meant nothing. You just gave a little money. And see, they took the beauty a passion and sacrifice and turned it in convenient and into convenience this so offended jesus that the bible says the zeal for my house has eaten me up jesus said that they quoted it about jesus and he stepped out of his normal demeanor of kindness and gentleness and love and patience and self-control and he literally got violent twice but the only thing that pushed him over the edge was how the church behaved and how they were selling out and he said I'm not taking it see God right now is turning over tables he's saying all that all of that that you think is good enough because it's super convenient and it's super cool and it, it's super what you like. God is saying none of it has to do with sacrifice. None of it has to do with passion. What are you giving up? And in, instead, God is saying, I'm not accepting this offering. So like Jesus walking through the temple and turning that stuff over and whipping folk, it was the violence of God. It so offended God that God said, I'm going to reset this thing. You know, they even sold doves in the temple. Sold doves. I don't know if you've been to that part of the world, but the reason God included doves as part of the sacrifice, it was for poor people. That poor people who couldn't afford a lamb or an ox or something extravagant, that they could participate in worship, that they could go make a little snare. And they put a little seed out there of bread, and the bird would walk into that snare, and they'd catch a bird. So even poor people could say, look what I have, it's mine. And poor people could come and bring something that they went and got for God, the one that they caught. But here they were selling doves, selling doves, like the cheapest. So it, it, cheapening God, cheapening worship, cheapening the sacrifice. Now listen, in the, in the reflection of the cross of Jesus, this was Passover in the reflection of the cross, in the shadow of the cross of Jesus. This was so offensive to Jesus. He said, I'm not accepting it. And much of our worship, and I'm not trying to be an ugly guy, but much of our worship has become what's good for us. What do I like? We leave services and say, what does God want from my life? Saying, I don't know if I like that or not. I don't know. I don't know if it'll be coming next week. This is a plague. This is a sickness where we no longer love God for who He is, that we no longer make our life a living sacrifice, but we cheapen it to something that we like and we feel. I say God wants to do a resurrection in this season, a resurrection of His church. In that day, convenience became king and God became second. I want to suggest it's a little bit like that right now. Convenience has become king. Your parking spot, the air conditioner, your seat, the music, the da ba da The preacher won't say anything to hurt your feelings. All of that stuff. That'll get you a whip from Jesus. Not from God the Father, from Jesus himself. That'll get you a whip because God said, I'm not accepting that kind of thing in the view of what it costs, what the cross cost. Remember Satan, he offered Jesus something. He said, I'll give you your destiny without the cross. And many people have changed Christianity to say, God wants to give you a great destiny, but you don't have to die. You don't have to give up your life. That was satanic. And Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. Many Christians and even churches say, yeah, heck yeah. If I can have it without sacrifice. And they're even calling it the grace of God. The grace of God is not that, that you don't have to go to the cross. The grace of God is that God sends the spirit of Jesus on your life and you get to be something that you never could have been without the power of God. That's what grace is. It's a gift. Now, 
what can we repent of? Repent of convenience being king and make Jesus king once again. I want to finish. And this is, pow- this is powerful and true to everyone who that are sitting there today. To have the new, you must confront the old with great force. If you want God's best for your life, if you want the new, then you're going to have to confront the old. You're going to have to make a whip of your own, turn over your own table and say, I'm getting rid of that. I'm getting rid of that attitude. I'm getting rid of that sloppiness. And I'm going to give everything to God. And when you do, man, awesome things are going to happen. To me, the ultimate expression of convenience Christianity is Easter Sunday. Even the name comes from a false god an idol, a a, a pagan belief. Easter Sunday, people from all over the world dress up and they say, God's going to be pleased with me for this one day. What a deception. Christianity cannot be reduced to one hour a year. That's not getting it done. God's not accepting it. God says, I want everything or nothing. If he is not Lord of all, he is not Lord at all all god says no thanks to just sundays no thanks to just easter sunday morning god says i want everything that you have i'm going to read this scripture and close with this this is mark 8 34 through 36 the passion translation this is jesus speaking jesus summoned the crowd along with his disciples and had them gather around and he said to them If you truly want to follow me, you should at once completely disown your own life. And you must be willing to share my cross and experience it as your own. As you continually surrender to my ways. For if you let your life go for my sake and for the sake of the gospel you will continually experience true life. But if you choose to keep your life for yourself, you'll forfeit what you try to keep. For what use is it to gain all the wealth and the power of this world with everything it can offer at the cost of your own life? Listen, if you want all that Jesus has, you got to give him all that you have isn't it interesting the bible says that when jesus whipped up the temple and tore all that stuff down that was repentance and when he did the bible says immediately he started doing miracles do you want the convenient church or the miracle church do you want to be the convenient easy going i can get away with anything i can do anything i feel like Do you want that or you want the real church where miracles are flowing through your life? Well, God is resetting you to something better. Today, if you want a resurrection of your whole life, you must die to your whole life. Without a death, there's not a resurrection. So church, the church of Jesus, I'm just going to, on God's behalf, standing here, a man just like you, I'm calling you to say, Jesus, I'm getting rid of all my casual attitudes, my sacrifice-less life, my cross-less life. I'm getting rid of all that. I'm coming back to the cross. I'm gonna die to myself and I'm gonna live for you and for your gospel. If that's what you wanna do on this Easter Sunday, you're gonna have a great resurrection. Pray this prayer with me before we go, okay? All of you that are sitting around and all of you that listen to my voice, pray it with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry, I changed my mind and I repent. I've made you too convenient. I've taken the passion and the sacrifice out of my worship. I've forgotten the gospel. I've left you out and put myself first. Pray it with me and I repent. Say it with me, as your church, I repent. Now say, Lord Jesus, at the cross, your blood paid for my sins. I receive forgiveness. I receive cleansing. I receive the power to change. 
Now declare this with me. Say, Lord Jesus, according to this repentance, I will never go back to being just a church member. I will never go back to being just a Christian. From this day on, I make my mind up to become like Jesus. I lay down my life, I pick up my cross, and I follow you. Amen. If you prayed that prayer with me, the power of God is coming on your life right now. This is the season of the resurrection of the church. Come on, church. Wake up. Resurrect. I have a song I want you to hear as we're closing. God bless you, and, uh, and keep your focus on Jesus.